There's an old Irish tale that says, in a twilight world somewhere between heaven and hell, there lives a race of magical, mischievous beings. Of course, we don't believe in such things anymore. But beware. The tale has a cruel twist. The less we believe, it says, the more we have to fear. Ever since there were people in Ireland, stories have been told of the magical She, a race of shadowy, elusive beings. They're the little people, like the crafty leprechaun and his crock of gold. The mermaid who lures sailors to their doom. And the banshee with her blood-curdling cry. We've all heard these lovely old fantasies, but that's all they are, right? Fairy tales, make-believe, innocent bedtime stories and childish superstitions. Nobody could possibly believe them in this day and age. And so we rest assured, knowing we are wiser and more sophisticated than fools who think otherwise. But bear one thing in mind. According to legend, the victims of these creatures are always the non-believers. And many of the old tales aren't quite so harmless either. Even the most famous of them all, the legend of the leprechaun. The leprechaun's a very tricky wee boy. And the one thing is you should never take your eyes off him, because he'll trick you if he can. There was a young fellow called Michael O'Grady one time, walking through the fields, and he heard the tap, tap, tap. Suddenly, tap, as the story tap, tap. goes, Michael caught sight of a leprechaun. Quick as a flash, he grabbed hold of the little fellow and demanded his pot of gold. Now the leprechaun knew he was trapped. So he took Michael to a certain tree in the middle of a nearby wood. Beneath this tree, he declared, was the treasure. All Michael had to do was dig it out. Michael knew his tiny captive would escape if he left. So he made the leprechaun swear an oath. I'm going to do something and you have to make me a promise. You have to make me a promise that if I mark that tree with this red guard around my leg, you'll keep that ribbon on it. I promise, said the leprechaun. No, you sure? I promise, I promise, on the pot of gold. Right, said Michael. And he set the wee man down and tied the ribbon round the tree. And on so the off way. Michael ran to fetch his spade. Into his own house, grabbed the spade, away he came. When he returned, the leprechaun was gone. But the little fellow had kept his promise. A red ribbon was tied to every tree in sight. He'd never find out which one the pot of gold was under unless he dug up the hole for us. Sure, all he could do was laugh. But it just goes to show, never trust a leprechaun. They're tricky boys. A little superstitious mischief never harmed anyone, we might think. And yet, some would say that mischief is the least of our worries. For these creatures are said to have a much darker side. All across Ireland are places linked to this dark side of fairy magic. Lonely thorn trees, standing stones and old forts, it's said, should be avoided at all costs. Disturb them and run the risk of incurring a fairy's wrath. Of course, that's just quaint superstition, isn't it? Like all so-called haunting tales, there's really nothing to fear. That's just what a certain fiddle player thought but as the story goes, he lived to regret it. Well, this was a great fiddler, and he was coming home from a big do. And uh, he could have gone round the road, but... There was the fiddler was making his way home one night when he decided to take a short cut across some fields. Before long, he found himself passing by a rath, or fairy fort. And there on the rim of the fort were the fairy folk, calling out for him to join them. Come in, Paddy. Come in, Paddy. We want you to play for us. We Hardly able to believe what was happening, he entered the ring and began to play for his strange hosts. He went, and the first thing they gave him was some great drink, and he loved it. And on he went playing, and they kept dancing all round him. And it went on for a while. The hours passed, 
and as the fairies danced around him, urging him to play faster and faster, they filled his pockets with gold and his belly with drink. And it went like that for what Paddy thought was the night. And at last they said, well, we have... Finally, as dawn began to break, they sent him on his way, bewildered but happy, his pockets filled with glittering coins. And uh, when he got near the house, here was the... When he reached his house, he was surprised to find a young man standing at his door. What are you doing here? You have no business here, said the man. You've been gone two years, and I've married your wife. Suddenly, the fiddler realized he'd been tricked. Quickly, he reached for the gold, but all he found was horse dung. And here they were filled with horse manure, and no gold. It was horse manure. <laughs> Still, a pocket full of horse manure and a little stolen time seem harmless enough. And besides, it's all in fun, right? Just a fairy tale. There's really nothing to fear. Or is there? Like thieves, it said, the fairy folk covet what we treasure most. Many believe they are harbingers of death, in league with the grim reaper himself. It is said that those who have heard the cry of the banshee, or the tap of her nails on the window pane in the dead of night, will soon know the true meaning of loss. Even the most innocent, many claim, have reason to fear. Those who believe the old tales say the fairies are stealers of children. In cradles where infants are put down for the night, they leave changelings, withered creatures who quickly waste away and die. According to legend, the stolen child will never grow old. Instead, it will live forever young in a realm without time. Discounted at your peril, because this realm, like the fairies themselves, has always been a mystery. Its existence has never been proved, but most mysterious of all, it has never been disproved either. Fairy tales, let's face it, are little more than children's stories and harmless superstitions. Only the very young or the very foolish could believe in them. We are too sophisticated. We know better. We have nothing to fear. Or do we? To many, even today, fairies are not the cute, gossamer-winged creatures of children's fiction. Those who believe speak of ghostly shapeshifters, Spirits that can appear in any form, even that of humans. So how can we be absolutely certain we've never seen one? One old story tells of a fisherman in the north of Ireland who falls in love with a mermaid. Refusing to believe she's one of the fairy folk, he sets out to possess her. And eventually a wise woman uh, can give him the advice that he needs and he realises that every evening this beautiful girl uh, unclips her tail and turns into a human for a certain amount of time as she sits by the sea singing. And so he steals the tail and with the tail he takes her power and so she must follow him home. And in the course of time this pair have two children and uh, the children are out playing one day and it's raining and they rush into the barn to play and they're th uh, throwing straw around and they dig down through the straw in their game and they come to this shiny iridescent thing under some old mouldy sh straw that hasn't been interrupted for years and when the mother saw this beautiful uh, shining iridescent thing lying in among the straw she realised it was her tail and she sent her children back into the house and she clipped the tail on and she flung herself off the highest cliffs and sang her way back out to sea very happy at last but when her husband came home that night, he was devastated to realise that his bride had gone and he never saw her again. He was very, very unhappy. But at night, when the children were are asleep, she would come back into the house and she would comb their hair and smile and sing to them because she was happy to be back reunited with her own people at last. A new version of an old tale, we might think. And yet, according to the local superstition of Rathlin Island on the northeast coast, the story is true. Here it said, the descendants of that same mermaid live on. They can be identified, or so it's claimed, 
by the webs of skin between their toes. Brave indeed are those who would go there asking for proof. According to legend, the fairies are elusive, crafty creatures who can appear and disappear without trace. This, of course, is quite convenient for the weave folk. After all, if they are invisible, who's to say they don't exist? Some, however, actually claim to have found proof. During the 19th century in the southwest of Ireland, a farm labourer came across a strange object. He believed it was an actual shoe belonging to the fairies. Terrified of the bad luck that might befall him if he kept it, he quickly passed it on. Strange as it may seem, it still exists. This is a shoe that was found first in 1834, and there are several strange things about it. First, you see that it shows signs of wear in the sole and heel. Um, secondly, it's been at some time mended rather clumsily. There are two heavy stitches in the back of the heel itself. At one time it's had laces. Uh, you can just see the eyelet holes at the end there. Um, I've shown it to a cobbler. He tells me that it's as good work as any cobbler could do. Indeed better because of its size and you can see how small it is. I've also shown it to the curator of a doll's museum and uh, she says that it's certainly not a doll's shoe. It's far too well made for that. It would be interesting to have the leather tested in a laboratory. I've not had this done, but in order to do it properly, you'd have to snip a bit off the shoe and I think that would probably, uh, the fairies mightn't like that, might they? Such fears may seem harmless enough but others aren't quite so innocent. The poet W.B. Yeats once wrote, Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild, with a fairy hand in hand, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. This poem, The Stolen Child, has always had a bittersweet message. In the past, the legend of the changeling, the child stolen by the fairies, was never meant to entertain and it often resonated with genuine tragedy. There were changeling traditions. Uh, if your baby wasn't doing particularly well, well, perhaps it had been changed. You know, it wasn't that the child was in some way um, handicapped or disadvantaged. Uh, the wee folk were to blame. They had substituted one of their own. Uh, women in childbirth were often taken away by the fairies. Again, maternal mortality being an extraordinarily uh, high, um, there's an extraordinarily high risk of maternal mortality here. And so fairies came to play, came to uh, interact directly in people's lives in this kind of way and could be blamed for all sorts of mishaps or things which might naturally go wrong, which were otherwise difficult to explain. Crib death, Down syndrome, all sorts of maladies that affect the young might have been the cause of such superstitions. And by rights, medical science should have put an end to the changeling tradition a hundred years ago. But strangely, it didn't. Even today, there are many still alive who remember ash being smeared on the faces of young children to ward off the wee folk. According to the changeling legend, the fairies are discerning meticulous thieves, and filthy youngsters are of no interest to them. Once, customs like these were common. The little folk were spoken of in hushed voices. Certain places were said to be inhabited by the fairies, mounds and thorns and trees. Those who interfered with them, according to local superstition, risked a fate worse than death. Innocent nonsense, we might assume, these days. But one fact remains. These places still exist. And to this day, even those who say they don't believe will never destroy them, dig them up, or even till the soil nearby. Why? What could they possibly have to fear? All over Ireland, there are trees, ancient standing stones and hills, which, legend has it, are possessed by the fairies. Tamper with them, it's said, and you risk disaster. 
a quaint old custom perhaps. But if this is the case, why do farmers still refuse to plough the soil where they stand? Why are modern roads and motorways diverted instead of passing through them? Why, in an age of rational thought, are these places still considered untouchable? Has an entire country gone mad? Or is it simply safer not to tamper with things we don't understand? Despite their strange appearance, many fairy forts, as we might suspect, are quite innocent. Some are raths, island homesteads which were common in Ireland right up to medieval times. But others have a much more ominous background. These are the tombs of Ireland's prehistoric ancestors, ancient mausoleums of stone and earth where the dead were buried over 4,000 years ago. Later, with the arrival of the Celtic people who came to Ireland centuries before the time of Christ, these old graveyards began to be seen as strange, supernatural places. They knew that these tombs weren't part of the natural landscape. They knew that some peoples somehow had built them. But these were mysterious peoples of the past. So that they situated their continental Celtic gods in these tombs in Ireland, in these old rats in the landscape. And also the Celts had a belief that when one dies, one doesn't just disappear, that one lives on in another world beside this world. So that within these ancient tombs and within these ancient artifacts in the landscape, they believed that the other world people lived on. Even with the arrival of Christianity in the 5th century, belief in this mysterious world of the dead survived. Gradually, as paganism disappeared, the tombs became ghostly monuments to every god and goddess, every banished demon and lost soul of Ireland's heathen past. Despite the disapproval of the church, the old superstitions refused to disappear. Right up to the last century, for example, iron tongs were often laid across the tops of cradles. The custom seems bizarre now, but once it made perfect sense. To the Celts, iron was believed to ward off evil spirits. And so, many centuries later, the folk memory survived, and iron tongs, like horseshoes, became good luck charms. Strangely, even now, in a time when such beliefs are considered totally irrational, they linger on. And still today, many of those who claim they don't believe wouldn't dare put the old superstitions to the test. Well, fairies, in a sense, are spirits, uh, but um, whether they exist or not, uh, I don't personally believe in them, but belief is a matter of emotion as well as of rationale. And uh, I wouldn't interfere with a fairy fort. That is an old earthenwork fort in the landscape. Um, we, are, we are told that if you dig up one of these forts, or if you cut down a fairy tree, a tree standing all alone in the landscape, if you cut that down, some bad luck will befall you. So that um, even though rationally I wouldn't believe in them, I wouldn't like to interfere with these places nevertheless. Even when fairy forts occupied valuable land, which could be used for farming, roads, homes, they were never disturbed. And there are many who are still convinced of their magical power. I know a man, I went to school with him in fact, and he would swear that he saw a leprechaun seated on the edge of a fort one morning, shaving himself. And no matter how hard he was questioned, he still uh, persisted in the belief that he did see a leprechaun in the vicinity of the fort. So, you know, that belief was very, very strong that they were the abodes of fairies, hence the name Fairy Fort. In the modern world, the superstition which once surrounded the fairy folk has faded. 
but strange as it may seem, a great many people still believe. Why? Is it simply that old habits die hard? Or could there really be more to the legends than we think? These days we are tempted to dismiss fairy legends as tall tales and harmless superstitions. But why then do so many cling to the old ways? Is it just force of habit? Or could it be something more sinister? Fear, perhaps. So even if people are uh, inclined to say, oh, I don't believe in fairies, they're still very aware of the power of the fairies. And so they function in all kinds of ways. They, they can uh, directly or indirectly actually govern people's behaviour. And on a more symbolic level, uh, they reflect the fact that there are great uh, environmental and supernatural forces which play upon people's uh, realisations in all kinds of ways that perhaps they don't always account for. In the past, people's behaviour was governed in more earthly ways too. And certain fairy tales have very little to do with magic. A returned emigrant, for instance, a cheating husband or wife, even a drunken farmer, could always blame their mysterious disappearance on the fairies. They hadn't simply gone missing. They had been lost in a fairy field or kidnapped by the wee folk. Certainly at times, the little people provided an all too convenient alibi. Most today say the fairies no longer exist. Christianity, they claim, has long since stamped out all trace of their existence and banished the pagan beliefs which kept them alive. According to some, the last of the fairies died out around 30 years ago. Since then, it is said, there have been so many masses and prayers offered up for the dead that Ireland has been cleansed of all superstition. Christianity, it seems, has finally banished the fairies. And yet, 30 years ago, exactly the same thing was said. And 30 years before that. And 30 years before that. No doubt, 30 years from now, it will be said again. Even the legends, it seems, are elusive. Fairies, you see, are never connected with the present, always with the past. Surprisingly, even the famous leprechaun is a latecomer to fairy lore. Like the mermaid, this mischievous elf-like figure was only introduced to Ireland during medieval times. Although few will risk bad luck by admitting it, the king of the fairies is little more than a colourful imposter. Fairies are largely superstition now, but there has to be some basis in fact, furthermore, wouldn't have survived for this long, and especially since um, the church had such a, an influence on the lives of people back 50, 60, 100 years ago. Why would religious people still do these things and tribute to fairies? They're going against the church's teaching as such. It's possible that the little people do exist. I wouldn't like to test it out by insulting them. But what of the fairies' most intriguing legend, the elusive crock of gold? It's just a myth, of course. But can we be so sure? During the 19th century, a county limerick farmer risked a lifetime of bad luck by planting rows of potatoes in a fairy fort on his land. But later, as he tilled the soil, he unearthed a goblet of solid gold, encrusted with jewels. It was the Arda Chalice, a priceless piece of 9th century church art, which had been wisely hidden in the fort to protect it from theft. For 10 centuries, people's belief in the fairies had kept it safe. Since then, things have certainly changed. The original fairy fort is all but destroyed now, but the chalice is displayed in the National Museum of Ireland as the nation's most valuable treasure. Perhaps, as many say, belief in the little folk was never more than just superstition. 
But superstition or not, the fairies kept Ireland's most priceless treasure safe for a thousand years. And even today, many people, whether they say they believe or not, are still not willing to defy the little people or go against the old taboos. Because, heaven forbid, they might actually be real. Are you prepared to take that risk? He was the slave boy who became patron saint and savior of the pagan Irish. The holy wanderer who banished Ireland's snakes and lit a fire in the hearts of her people that would never go out. He was Patrick, perhaps the world's most legendary saint. He was the slave boy who became patron saint and savior of the pagan Irish. The holy wanderer who banished Ireland's snakes and lit a fire in the hearts of her people that would never go out. He was Patrick, perhaps the world's most legendary saint. The legend of St. Patrick, Ireland's patron saint, has been woven through the ages into a rich and colorful tapestry that has come to symbolize that land the world over. As the story has been passed down, it was he who walked the hills and the valleys of Ireland, preaching his gospel of love and redemption. He who banished all the snakes from its shores. He who, with a bishop's crozier in one hand, and a sprig of shamrock in the other, converted the pagan Irish to Christianity over 15 centuries ago. And yet, beneath this glorious mantle of legend and superstition was a real person. And in his confession, the oldest surviving writings in the annals of Irish history, he tells us himself who he was and where he came from. I am Patricius a sinner, the most unlearned of men. My father was Calponius, a deacon. He ministered in Benavon Taberniae, where he had a country residence nearby. It was here that I was taken captive. At the age of 16, Patricius, a young Welsh nobleman, fell victim to a raiding party from across the sea and was sold into slavery in Ireland. He got his first sight of the land that would one day take him to its heart through the planks of a pirate ship's hold. He was sold to a chieftain in the north who set him tending sheep. (laughs) 
the young captive found himself in a very different country to the one he had left behind. Here, the High King ruled with his druids, the ancient and mysterious priests of the Celtic people. The people Patrick met were pagans, with strange customs and superstitions. But Patrick grew to love the ordinary Irish people for their good humor, their love of life, and their great appetite for music and storytelling. Patrick also grew to love God. And one night, on the lonely hillside that was his home, he had a vision. In a dream, a messenger told him that a ship awaited, ready to carry him out of captivity to do God's work. At first light the next morning, Patrick stole away from his captors and embarked on a perilous journey that would take him the length of Ireland and across the sea. There he would learn to become a shepherd of men. But the land of his captivity was never far from his mind. I saw a vision in the night, and I heard the familiar accents of the people. They called out as if they had one voice. We beseech you, holy youth, come and walk once more among us. And so the shepherd boy returned a bishop, sent to make God's children out of the pagan Irish. And in the manner of his arrival, he demonstrated to all his bravery and the power of his faith. The day that Patrick arrived back in Ireland, whether by luck or design, was the Feast of Light. Across the land, all fires had been extinguished, for the king was giver of light, and the people lit their fires only after the great beacon on the royal hill of Tara had been lit by the king himself. But as the king prepared to set the sacred beacon ablaze, a cry of dismay went up from his warriors and druids. <laughs> Across the dusky plain, another beacon was already burning brightly on the Hill of Slain. The king's druids had foretold that one day a light would be lit that would never go out. And so it was to be. In time, Patrick's beacon would shed its light on every part of Ireland. And as the love of God grew in the hearts of its people, so the legend of Patrick began to take hold in their imagination. But what became of the shepherd boy? Who is the man who wrote the first words ever written in Irish history? And why does his feast day bring some of the world's largest cities to a standstill some 15 centuries later? The Confession of St. Patrick, penned towards the end of the 5th century, is the first written document in Irish history. It begins with an account of Patrick's early life, where we discover that the great patron saint of Ireland was not himself Irish. He grew up in a town somewhere along the west coast of Britain. The islands of Ireland and Britain, lying at Europe's western edge, were very different places during the fifth century. At that time, uh, slavery was a, a normal practice, and Patrick was taken as a slave by Irish people who were raiding Roman Britain because when the Romans came to Britain uh, in the first century uh, AD, uh, Roman Britain became, became wealthy, and so it was a source of wealth for the Irish, and they raided along the coast of Britain, particularly in the fourth century and early fifth centuries. We have many examples of that through the archeological record, the objects that they brought back with them and so on, and indeed references in the sources, the, the Roman sources to the Irish raiding Britain. And on such raids, uh, they brought back uh, slaves. 5th century Ireland was home to the last Celtic civilization in Europe. After they had been subdued by the Romans elsewhere, this proud pagan race of warriors, poets, craftsmen and druids survived unchallenged in Ireland. Patrick, the young nobleman turned shepherd, spent his first years in this strange land on Slemish, 
a windswept mountain in the north. It was there he learned the ways of his captors, and there his love for the Irish people took root in his heart. It was this love that would call him back to Ireland many years later as a shepherd of men. He had an absolute dedication to the Irish, to his converts, and felt it an absolute mission to bring the word of God to the pagan Irish, the people that had actually held him captive in Ireland. Uh, and his mission, therefore, was a mission to pagans quite distinct. And for that reason, his life was in constant danger. He was often held in chains, uh, in captivity, while he was actually uh, preaching in Ireland and teaching in Ireland, and relied on his converts and friends to ransom him and, uh, and, and rescue him. The story of Patrick's beacon on the Hill of Slain and his legendary defiance of the king and his druids is not recorded by him in his confession. Yet, it is one of the oldest and most persistent legends. It represents the first confrontation in Ireland between the old pagan religion and the new Christian faith. Patrick could not have chosen a better stage for this first encounter. To the south lay the royal hill of Tara, seat of the Irish High Kings, and nearby in the east were the great megalithic tombs of the Boyne Valley, the oldest and most sacred precinct of pagan Ireland. In Celtic society, the Druids were wise and holy men and held positions of great power and influence. To defy them or to blaspheme against their laws was to risk almost certain death. By making his courageous stand during the Feast of Light, Patrick was laying down a challenge to the laws of the Celtic Druids. And in the name of God, he was laying claim to the souls of the Irish people. So the legend of Patrick's beacon is often regarded as a symbol of his coming rather than an actual event in his life. One tantalizing piece of evidence, however, suggests that the real Patrick was just as courageous as this legend would have us believe. A letter written by Patrick to Coroticus, a British prince, has survived intact to the present day. In it, Patrick condemns Coroticus for the slaughter of Irish converts by raiders from Britain. Newly baptized in their white clothing, the oil still shining in their heads, they were cruelly butchered and slaughtered by the sword. I cannot say how many. So may the wrong done not please you, and even into hell may it give you no pleasure. The saint's own words reveal a most extraordinary man, bold and determined, not afraid to confront a powerful warrior. Perhaps he deserves some of the later legends which have been attributed to him. He was a man of the earth, a man of the people. And so that means that we can say everything we read about him, everything we read that he wrote and said and taught, has got that lovely common touch. It's, it's earthed in the Ireland of his day. But he was a very spiritually minded person of the people. And I think that gives the clue to his importance. I believe there's sufficient evidence to say there was the boy Patrick, the Brit Patrick, the person who came to Ireland with a particular tradition, a particular background, but who became more Irish than the Irish. I believe that man existed. And I think it's very wrong for him to be given just a political or religious or single cultural identity. He was a man, if you'll forgive the phrase, for all seasons and all time. Legend has it that Patrick's influence spread quickly to all parts of Ireland. As he traveled throughout the land, people flocked to hear the words of the former slave and shepherd boy. And inspired by his simple message of love, king and commoner alike set aside their pagan ways and were baptized into the Christian church by Patrick's own hand. Years later, in 
Yet glorious as this vision may seem, Ireland's conversion from paganism to Christianity was a more difficult task, and one which required a subtle and inventive mind. As Patrick and the missionaries who came after him would discover, compromise, not conversion, was the key to success. And the genius of Ireland's early bishops was their ability to integrate pagan practices to the new religion. Indeed, it was the fusion of Christian symbolism with Ireland's more ancient pagan beliefs that in the end would assure the success of Patrick's mission. No portrait of Patrick is complete without the serpents he banished cowering beneath his feet. While there are several saints who are credited with similar deeds around Europe, St. Patrick has one distinct advantage over other claimants. There are indeed no snakes in Ireland. Patrick, of course, traditionally is associated with getting rid of the snakes out of Ireland. That is one of the lovely stories growing up around him. In fact, he had nothing at all to do with the snakes. The snakes were banished from Ireland with the Ice Age. In Christian tradition, the snake represents the devil, the power of evil, and the dangers of temptation. Yet even today, many of the most celebrated aspects of Patrick's legend are heavily imbued with beliefs and superstitions older than Christianity itself. Perhaps the most famous is the link between Patrick and the simple shamrock, a plant which has become a symbol of all that is Irish around the world. According to legend, Patrick found himself in difficulty one day as he attempted to explain the mystery of the Holy Trinity to a pagan chieftain. Then, at his feet, he noticed a clump of shamrock. Taking a single stem, Patrick told him the three leaves of the shamrock united on one stem, were like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons in one God. On the surface, this little tale seems to be nothing more than an innocent Christian parable. Until, that is, we look a little deeper. During the fifth century, shamrocks were rare, and it is more likely that the plant which Patrick plucked was a piece of three-leafed cress which grew in abundance. Cress was known to the Druids as a plant of magical properties, and it is said that they brewed from its leaves an aphrodisiac. As a fellow Celt, Patrick would have been sympathetic to the ancient superstitions. But instead of condemning these pagan traditions, his genius lay in reclaiming them, even using the ingredients of a pagan love potion to explain the most sacred mystery of the Christian faith. But just as Patrick appropriated pagan traditions to spread his message, so would his own reputation be usurped by others with less noble aspirations. According to one legend, while Patrick was baptizing King Angus of Munster, he inadvertently put the spike of his crozier through the royal convert's foot. The king said nothing, thinking it was part of the ceremony. And Patrick was said to be so pleased with the king's devotion that he promised none of his descendants would ever die of a wound. Like many other tales of Patrick, the legend of the king's conversion probably has little basis in truth. And it is far from the only legend associated with the saint to have been invented. In the case of King Angus, the men of the Munster region no doubt used the story to taunt their enemies. Such a blessing would have made them formidable soldiers. Alas for them, we can be fairly sure that Patrick never came to Munster. Ireland in the 5th century was a very heavy forested island uh, with many inland lakes and bogs, making it a totally impossible place to uh, travel very, very quickly. And therefore, the number of places associated with St. Patrick uh, could never have been covered by one individual in a normal lifetime. But for millions, the life of St. Patrick is more important than any of the colourful legends which surround it. And so, even today, the greatest of Patrick's legacies lives on. The devotion which, for over 15 centuries, has kept his spirit alive. 
This is where the legendary Patrick steps out of the realms of myth into living history. In many ways, the journey of Patrick's life has become an icon of the Christian faith. Even today, there are many places in Ireland, like towering Croke Patrick on Ireland's Atlantic shore, associated with the saint, that are sacred to pilgrims around the world. But what is it that can still draw huge crowds to follow in the footsteps of a fifth century missionary, to seek out the bleakness and hardship of the wilderness where Patrick once walked? It is said that Patrick would often travel far into the wilds to pray in solitude, as he had done as a young shepherd boy. One stormy night, according to legend, he took refuge in a cave on an island in the middle of a great lake. During the night, he awoke to a terrible vision. The back of the cave had split open. And as Patrick gazed on in horror, he saw the grisly torments of hell. The island on Loch Derg, where the vision is supposed to have taken place, has been a shrine to Patrick since medieval times. It is known as St. Patrick's Purgatory, and each year thousands of pilgrims from all over the world still visit this great basilica. For three days they come here to deprive themselves of sleep, walk barefoot on jagged stones and pray constantly. In doing so, they honor the memory of Patrick. The hardship, it is said, reminds the pilgrim of the vision which Patrick himself witnessed, the horror which awaits the unrepentant sinner. We're here at Saul, uh, traditionally the first site of the first Christian church in Ireland. Patrick, when he arrived back as a missioner, uh, after his escape from being a prisoner, he was offered an outhouse uh, in the Irish Sabal, meaning uh, a, a pig house. Uh, that was his first church, traditionally on this site. And from the fifth century right down to the present day has been a place where Christians of all denominations have worshipped. It was here at Saul that Patrick died. The legends say that for 12 days afterwards, the sun blazed in the sky and night refused to fall. At his burial, the men of Ulster placed his body on a cart drawn by untamed oxen and carried it to a place now called Down Patrick, where they buried him. But the Ulstermen were not the only ones to claim that Patrick lay beneath their soil. Indeed, many towns claim the honor. Because of the many different, conflicting accounts of his death, the final resting place of Ireland's patron saint remains controversial to this day. The great slab at Dan Patrick is favored by many, but no one is sure. But if Patrick's actual body cannot be located, that doesn't mean there aren't many different centers for his cult. In addition to Saul, perhaps his first church, there is Armagh, where Patrick is said to have founded a great cathedral. However, today in Armagh there are two cathedrals, one Catholic, the other Protestant, both dedicated to Patrick. Both regard Patrick as their founder. Relics of St. Patrick were also plentiful in the centuries that followed his death. There was money to be made in having a piece of the great man a strong incentive for churches and monasteries all over Ireland to discover a relic of their own. One of the most macabre is this jawbone, 
cherished for centuries as the very jaw that once pronounced the great saint's teachings. Today, archaeologists consider most of these so-called relics to be medieval fakes, except for one. A simple bronze handbell, which dates from the correct period, now encased in this domed and jeweled bell shrine, is now thought to have been one of Patrick's personal possessions. Patrick is remembered in folk tradition as the nation's spiritual champion, who still looks down from heaven on his flock. Even today, the annual parades in his honor continue to bring some of the world's largest cities to a standstill. Yet here, there is another surprise. The parade that has become an expression of all that is Irish actually originated in America, where the English and American armies would conduct military parades on that day to encourage reluctant Irishmen to enlist. But there is one final unwritten chapter in the legend of Ireland's patron saint. One day, it is said, Patrick will return. In the last years of his life, though the venerable saint was an old man, he set out to climb a great mountain, known today as Croak Patrick, to find peace and solitude. The legends say he met an angel there, who granted him whatever he wanted because of the great good he had done. Patrick asked that the Irish people should be spared the Armageddon, and that on the last day of creation, he himself would be their judge. Down the generations, Patrick has become the embodiment of Irish identity and national integrity. Even today, Irish men everywhere are known, not always affectionately, as paddies. But what of Patrick the man? What of the shepherd boy turned bishop? The pirate's slave turned patron saint. Unlike many characters of the Dark Ages, with Patrick, we may peer back through centuries of myth, legend, and folklore, and read his own words as he wrote them. That he may one day return, no one can know. That he came and left in his wake a very different Ireland, there can be no doubt. <laughs>